Okay, we are now here. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, thanks to the panelists' participation in today's discussion as part of our continued theme of restorative justice in the criminal legal system. For those tuning in for the first time, uh, welcome. And for other folks who have been following us along the series, uh, the webinar series with us, welcome back. Uh, once again, my name is Avery Arrington. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm one of the assistant directors at the National Center on Restorative Justice, where um, I help facilitate things like this, resources, bringing information to the general public uh, about restorative justice in the criminal legal system. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Robert Sand, but don't forget, uh, for more information, please visit us at NCORJ. Uh, dot org and check out some of the National Center's initiatives and some research developments and other opportunities that we're offering. And as always, our resources of, are free of charge. Turn it over to you. Avery, thank you so much. Uh, as Avery mentioned, my name is Robert Sand. I use he, him pronouns, uh, and Bobby is fine. Uh, I am a professor at the Vermont Law and Graduate School and the founding director of its Center for Justice Reform that includes a Master of Arts in Restorative Justice and a Professional Certificate in Restorative Justice. I was a prosecutor for 22 years, 15 of them as the elected state's attorney or DA for Windsor County, Vermont. What I can say is that I have never spoken with a retired prosecutor, or for that matter, a retired judge who has said, reflecting on their career, that they wish they had been more punitive. And what I can certainly share with you all is that if I could go back in time, there are a lot of things that I would do differently. So perhaps today we will learn about some different ways of conducting business, both in court and perhaps outside of court. Our hope is that we will learn about some specific restorative justice applications in courts across the country, but then also think more broadly about how RJ can augment and complement our existing approaches. Some of the questions that I will pose will be very specific and some may be more philosophical. Some of the questions may be directed to particular judges, others will be toss-ups. Your honors, I want you all to know, please, even if I don't direct a particular question to you, uh, if you'd like to weigh in, please, please do so. And audience members at the probably the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A section and please post your questions there and Avery will screen those and assuming we have some time at the end, we'll get to audience questions. So we're incredibly lucky to have an amazing panel of judges here today from across the country. So let's go west to east. First, we have Wesley St. Clair, a retired Superior Court judge from King County, Washington. That includes Seattle. Patricia Spratt, a Circuit Court judge from Cook County, Illinois. That includes Chicago. Timothy Connors, a trial court judge from Washtenaw County, Michigan. That includes Ann Arbor. And Leo Sorokin, a United States District Court judge for the District of Massachusetts, sitting in Boston. So perhaps in that same order, Judge Wesley, Judge Spratt, Judge Connors, Judge Sorokin, would you introduce yourself a little bit further? Tell us the type of court in which you preside, and then briefly describe your current involvement with restorative justice. And Avery, I'll leave it to you to decide if you want to screen share or go to full screen. So Judge Wesley, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. 
Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, join in this discussion. Uh, I am uh, the court I retired from as a court of general jurisdiction out of Seattle, uh, King County, Washington. Retired after 30 years on the bench. Uh, retired in 2019. My last 10 years, uh, nine years, I sat as in juvenile court. Um, and um, the last seven years of that was as chief judge of juvenile court. Uh, I was in the role, I've, I've always had a career, I've always been interested in uh, therapeutic jurisprudence as I was a, um, a drug court judge, adult drug court judge, as well as a juvenile drug court judge when I got to juvenile court. Uh, and so uh, in, in King County, it was in the auspices of sitting at the intersection of um, the court system, uh, child welfare, as well as education system that it became uh, evident that our system um, were engaged in practices that resulted in uh, these kind of disparate outcomes, especially for black and brown children. We were in the process of building a new uh, juvenile court facility, which included a detention facility. And I was confronted by activists who said, stop locking up our brown and black and brown children. And I asked, so what, is, what, what do you propose? And they mentioned restorative practices, restorative justice. Uh, I then began the process of doing my own kind of due diligence about what that really means. I engaged in peacemaking process, which is an indigenous practice, uh, conflict resolution practice. And um, decided that it, it, given the outcomes we were having in our juvenile uh, criminal and civil legal processing systems, why not try something different? Um, we then instituted a uh, program specifically, kind of a low level program started off, but then we start taking uh, robberies, robberies in the first degree, deadly weapon involved, and uh, put the youth through um, a, a peacemaking process took um, probably close to a year to do with uh, uh, many circles in the course of it. And um, it, 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 it felt like it was a healing process, not just an accountability process, but also a process of introspection for the young people to view themselves in different light as opposed to the light sometimes that the community views young people. Um, and so I, I became a, a, a real uh, advocate, proponent of it. You know, sometimes I was the only voice at the table. Uh, we had 63 judicial officers in, in King County and at that, that level. And oftentimes uh, uh, people would say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. But, but the, you know, one of the comments was, well, I'm not going to hug a thug. And uh, uh, that isn't, that's not harsh enough for me. You know, I want I want something that is a account uh, has a lot of accountability to it. When really I think what they meant what they has punishment to it. Um, it has incarceration associated with it. So um, that's kind of how I got introduced. And even though I've retired at this point in time, I still find myself very actively engaged in the conversation about uh, how our systems can and should do better. Thank you. Judge, I'm definitely going to follow up on a, a couple of the points you made. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, Judge Spratt, the microphone is yours. And your microphone is muted. Thank you. Uh, for the last nine years, I've been a board member in a uh, volunteer at an organization on the west side of Chicago called Build Chicago, and its purpose is to engage youth who are at risk or of being drawn into gang and criminal activity or being harmed by it. And it was in that my presence at the organization when a dispute erupted between two opposing gang members 
And immediately when that dispute erupted, everybody in the building stopped what they were doing and sat down into a, a peace circle. I'd never seen behavior like this. It's, it was incredible. And I sat, stood there and watched how that circle worked. And by it took about two hours. And by the end of that time, everybody was in tears and everybody was hugging everybody. And the, the issue had been resolved. And if I thought to myself, if that this can work on the roughest part of town between two opposing gang members. This has got some real hope for the rest of us. So I looked into it with my chief judge. Do we have a, the ability to engage in restorative practices for the court? And he said, funny, you should say that. We're starting court on in North Lawndale. And the, the judge who was the, promoted, the, the prime promoter of it was a the judge who sat in juvenile court, Judge Colleen Sheehan, who had used circles with her youth and their the arresting police officers with some success. So they opened up this court in North Lawndale in 2017, and Judge Sheehan presided there for two years until she retired. And when she announced she was retiring, the chief judge asked me if I would like to take it over. So I've been presiding in the North Lawndale Restorative Justice Community Court since 2017. It's a court that is community driven. Uh, in order to establish the court, of course, there had to be buy-in from the county officials, the state's attorney, the public defender, uh, the, the county board, which would be funding it, the county clerk, which would be keeping the records of it, and various and sundry court reporters, but everybody bought into it. And it doesn't operate as a court. It operates we call it a court and I sit in in the court, but I do not wear my robe. I do not sit on a bench. We all sit in, we try to approximate a circle using rectangular tables. Uh, and everybody who comes into the court sits at that table when we're talking to them. And the point is restorative practices, which is repairing the harm. The community provides case managers for these young people, as well as circle keepers. So I, as a member of the court, have nothing to do with participating in the restorative process. All the magic happens in the circles. Um, that's where the young people cast off the layers and layers and layers of emotional body armor that protects them from harm, they think, and they reveal who they really are. What I tell them when they come into my court is that the difference between the restorative justice court and the court at the criminal division is there at the criminal division, the interest is focused on what you were doing the moment the police officer arrested you. That's it, a snapshot in time. Nobody cares about what led up to it, why you needed to do it. It's just that you did it. And if you had stayed in that court, your lawyer, really good lawyer, would have told you, we're going to make the state prove its case. We're going to go to trial and you're not going to you're not getting on the witness stand. And I tell them, you know, eight out of 10 times the person is convicted and you're not asked to tell your story or to say anything until sentencing when the judge says, young man, young lady, is there anything you want me to know or you want the court to know? By then it's too late. So our process is you go into the circle process and you form relationships with your circle keepers and the other members of the circle and you let down your guard, you let people in, and you let us know why you did that, what led up to that, what in your life was going on, and what would you like to change, and what potential do you have to change it? And it's a, uh, I wish I had more judges listening to me, especially in my circuit, because it's not, it's not a make-believe court, it's a real effective court, and we have the statistics to prove it. We just had a, a uh, study done on the recidivism rates of the people who come through the restorative justice court and graduate and followed them for two or three years after they graduated versus people who stay in the circuit court with similar crimes uh, or similar charges against them and who then go into, ultimately they serve jail time. And the recidivist rate for our court is 13%. For the rest of Cook County, it's 65% or better. Uh, that proves to me that this works and we should snap some heads around and get them to get on board with this. Um, that's my story. <laughs> Judge, we will snap those heads restoratively, of course. Of course. Uh, 
So thank you. And you actually anticipated some of my other questions, but I will likely loop back. And I really appreciate your brief description of the general passivity of responsible parties in the traditional system uh, as compared to the active accountability that we see in restorative justice. So thank you for that. Uh, Judge Connors, hopefully our tech is working. Can you uh, brief intro and tell us about your RJ involvement? And you too may be muted. Still muted. So why don't we do this, Judge, while you're working on that? Judge Sorokin, how about we pass to you while Judge Connors sorts that out? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm actually going to start with something that Judge St. Clair said, that someone said to him about hug -a and somebody said to him they didn't want to hug -a And I think it's actually a really good thing to think <laughs> about. Um, uh, because the question really, if some someone people have said to me, oh, you know, what, various things. I used to run a drug court uh, or a restorative justice program. Well, that stuff's just hug a thug, and I won't do that. People will say, and I'm putting aside the fact that I'm not hugging anybody in the courtroom, um, thugs or otherwise. The real question to ask is why, and I think that it's a critical question if you really think you're a lawyer or a judge. Because if you're a lawyer or a judge, then I think you have to be open to thinking about ideas and thinking about your positions critically in the face of law and statutes and arguments and rules and policy and effect. And if you know the answer, which is, I won't hug a thug, I don't need to know anymore, my response is, well, why are you a lawyer or a judge? How do you, why won't you do that? If someone told me that actually hugging the people who came before me would help them take, would mean they took responsibility for their crimes and they wouldn't do it again, I'd probably hug them if they would be okay with that. And because my duty is not to some, my duty is to the constitution and to law, but my duty is also as a public servant to the community. And if, um, if some mom said to me, you mean that drug dealer who sold drugs after he was in your court, would you give him a jail sentence, sold drugs to my son and killed him? And you could have stopped that by hugging him and you wouldn't? that mother would have a fair point. Um, so I don't hug people because I don't know that that works or that that makes a difference. But I think it's an important thing to think about and it highlights a lot of people's resistance to new ideas or to different ways of thinking about it is they don't want to even engage with the discussion. And what I found about restorative justice, I heard about it first at a conference at the Sentencing Commission many years ago. And I was struck that, wow, this way of thinking about things makes a lot of sense to me because we think that the harms of victims should be addressed and their needs addressed and we should put them front and center. That's enshrined in various statutes and laws and makes perfect sense. And we also expect defendants or people who've been determined by, by the law to have committed crimes to take responsibility for their crimes. That's what we want them to do and to be accountable for them and to repair that. And for those of us who are religious at all, um, I'm no religious scholar, but from my own religion and my general familiarity with others, um, most religions think that it's that people should take responsibility for their wrongs, that they should make amends for their wrongs. So it's sort of consistent with our like a non-legal cultural ethos. And those seem to me to be central tenets of restorative justice. So I was really struck by it when I heard about a few little programs. And and I started at our court looking into it. And I created uh, I created LEAD, but that sort of overemphasizes me, uh, a program of restorative justice. And really, the, uh, the heart and soul of our program are uh, a probation officer and some lawyers, some prosecutors and defense attorneys who facilitate it and um, some mothers who are um, what we call surrogate victims, victims of, of serious crimes. Many have lost children uh, to drug overdoses, uh, violence, um, who participate in our circles and lead them 
and really make the difference in what we do. And it's those people who make it happen. And so our program is open. I'm in the federal court, so I see a whole range of federal crimes. And our program is open to both release defendants, detained defendants, uh, although the defend, detained part is a little newer. And um, it's really an opportunity for defendants to engage with harm uh, that they caused, engage with people who've been harmed, um, and to think about those issues and for people to connect. We don't promise people anything other than we'll consider all the facts and evidence that's relevant to their case at sentencing, which would include we don't learn what happened in the circle. And what I tell people is I don't care what happened in the circle. I care what happens in the person's words and deeds afterwards. And so we look at that and um, we give people that opportunity um, in the circle process and with some sort of pieces before and after um, to both um, think about these issues. And so that's what we've done. We found that for some people, it's unbelievably transformative um, and amazing difference for some defendants in terms of their lives. But the other thing we found interestingly is, you know who likes the program the most? The victims who mm -hmm. participate because they find it incredibly empowering and incredibly healing. And um, so they would like very much for us to do more and to make it bigger and make it more available. So it's a really, um, uh, uh, I think for anyone who's willing to think, to look at things and think about them, then it is really um, eye-opening. And I, I will leave with just one other comment. The sort of core questions, who's been harmed? Have they been harmed? Who's responsible to repair the harm? And how might we repair the harm, address the needs of the victims? Are really questions that every judge should ask at every every <clears throat> hearing, because if you ask those questions of yourself in hearings, you will think of large and small things to do. As small, I'll give an example. I had a sentencing, and there were some family members of someone who was a victim, and there was a monitor just set up at the lawyer's lectern, and where they happened to sit in the gallery obstructed their view of the bench and me. And I thought about that and noticed it, and I had someone go over and move it. And it's a very small thing. And many people who aren't thinking in a restorative <clears throat> justice framework who are judges would do that too. But it's every little, if you start asking these questions, you think of little things like that and you think of big things, all of which are within the rules <clears throat> and certainly supported by the policies that the rules animate. And so I um, think these kind of questions and these kinds of approaches are very important. Um, so I'll leave it with that for now. Judge, I appreciate that. And when you think about those questions you posed, there is no case that comes into the criminal legal system for which those questions are not appropriate. The other thing I really appreciate uh, is your discussion about responsible. And we have systems that are very good at using that phrase in terms of who did something wrong. But we are lousy at saying that people are responsible for fixing, for making amends. It really is a, a word that has two different definitions. Okay, we're definitely going to loop back to some of your comments as well. So thank you for that. Judge Connors, how are we doing on unmuting? Looks like you're unmuted can you, now, Your Honor. Can you hear me? Yes. Grant, it worked. <laughs> God, I hate talking through these damn machines to each other, but it is what it is. Listen, um, my name is Tim Connors. I'm a state court judge. I'm, I'm in my 33rd year on the bench. And I'm a court of general jurisdiction, but in those 33 years, I have served as a municipal court judge a probate court judge, and in fact, a tribal court judge on assignment. So I've been very privileged. I came to peacemaking and restorative justice about 15 years ago when uh, we have 12 federally recognized tribes here in Michigan. Our Supreme Court was concerned about our lack of compliance 
uh, with the Indian Child Welfare Act. And as we sought to increase and understand the importance of that, I first heard about peacemaking from our tribal courts. And I went to our Supreme Court and said, we've been missing the boat. We really need to learn about this. Over a decade ago, the Supreme Court agreed, backed me, and we established the first peacemaking court here in the state in Ann Arbor. Uh, but unlike a diversion, I said and felt, and the, our Supreme Court agreed, it needs to be inside of our court as well as outside as a diversion. So I'm on the bench on purpose here to show you where it started. And tribal court judges sat here, right here with me to get it started. But as I look out, there's a big circle of chairs in the, and I actually get off the bench and I do sit in circle in cases. We have applied uh, peacemaking to every kind of case in our state court system, every single one with success. And later today, I'll talk about one which involved an adult uh, felony shooting case uh, because I think it's germane to some of the interest that you have. So thank you. I'm glad we can hear each other. And it's my pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Judge. I, I'm going to pose a question that ordinarily I think I'd ask at the end, but uh, I'm inspired to ask it now. And it's prompted by uh, a number of you indicating that you had involvement with uh, treatment or problem solving courts. We had a judge in Vermont where I am who was assigned to a treatment court. Uh, she somewhat reluctantly accepted that assignment and said it completely changed her perspective on presiding. She's now a justice of our Vermont Supreme Court at, but still says to this day that experience changed uh, how she perceived her role. So my question for you all is to what extent has your involvement with restorative justice approaches and philosophies influenced or changed your relationships with colleagues staff, counsel, and individuals uh, accused of crimes, convicted of crimes, and people who've been harmed by uh, criminal conduct. And so how has RJ, if at all, changed how you operate as a judge? And happy to have any of you start. I'll, I'll jump in if you want. Go so ahead, Thank two you. things come to mind immediately. Uh, first, um, RJ has changed the way I interact with people who've been harmed by crimes. Um, uh, first, um, I have now, it's my practice, in every case in which we have, criminal case in which we have an identifiable victim, we have typically 10 or 12 weeks between a conviction and sentencing. Um, and during that time, I schedule a status conference on the record in court for, and for the one or many victims or persons who are harmed. And I'm uh, for two purposes, to explain the sentencing hearing process, the law, the fact, how, the, how procedurally it works, what the law is, but also to answer, I tell people I'll answer any question they have. And if I can't answer it, I'll explain why I can't answer it. Um, uh, I also, that's one thing I do. The other is I think about... Um, for people who've been harmed, what their experience with the trial would be like, or what their experience with the um, sentencing process, or any other aspect of the between arraignment and and sentencing, and so I make arrangements as appropriate for them to could be a separate room if it's going to be particularly difficult to listen to the evidence. They have their own space. Um, it could be where people move around in the courtroom so say the victim doesn't have to walk by the defendant. Um, uh, so I think that's one thing that's changed is sort of a much more attuned to the needs, small and large of the victims, and to help them participate and the, understand the process so, they're, so they understand what's happening and so that they can have a bigger voice. And the other is uh, for persons who are accused or convicted of crimes, I talk to them. 
as well about the range of harms that flow from what they did. And in two ways, I both talk about the particular kinds of harms that might be obvious that you know, nonetheless, but I talk about it, that would flow from whatever crime or crimes they've been convicted of, but also how it's harmed the kinds of harms that might be in their life, both ways in which the crime might have affected them and harmed them and their loved ones uh, in terms of separation or what have you, um, and, and, um, and an effort for them to engage with the process and, and to give them, and I think the other lesson I've taken from restorative justice is that both the people harmed and the people um, who did who committed the crimes or the, uh, did the harm uh, should understand they are empowered if they choose to be. So I tell defendants that they have the keys to the jail cell. They've given them to me, but they control them. They can, by their conduct in the future, take those keys back and by what they do. And we're going to try to help them do that because it's to our benefit if they are able to do that. And this, the restorative justice process or in talking to the victims helps them become empowered in the process. And so those are two things that come to my mind. Uh, does Connors, any thoughts on how RJ has influenced your relationship with others? Sure. Uh, because we don't do it just purely as a diversion, but we actually incorporate it in our proceedings here. Um, our attorneys have participated in circles as well, and it has transformed their approach to how they advocate on behalf of their clients. We find that even in the formal proceedings, we still apply it in the way we do it. And the concepts and the philosophies uh, that are in restorative justice and peacemaking, I incorporate in my decisions. And those decisions have gone up and they've started to filter into the appellate adoption, the appellate decisions adopting that. So I think um, it has dramatically influence the way we advocate in a courtroom. And it has definitely brought our community into our courtroom. And some of the other judges you're talking about, I view it as our responsibility as public servants for our community, not as one where it is a question of power and authority. I'm curious, I have sometimes found that criminal defense attorneys are the most reluctant folks because of the uncertainty of how the restorative process may unfold. I'm curious, Judge Connors, if you have had a similar experience. I think that's true. I think it's because of the way we're trained. I think it's, you know, they're so used to, uh, the training is say nothing, don't say anything, you, you know, it can come against you. I'm very interested in what uh, the other judges are saying about the victims finding it very important. And that's been my experience too. That so that that whole process where a defendant can't speak and where a victim can't talk to the defendant and we label these cases and send everybody back out into community and we have not helped the situation at all. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think this is why I think we need to teach it in the law schools that we're doing. I'm glad. Vermont Law School is one of them. University of Michigan Law School is one of them. Wayne State Law School is one of them. Stanford is one of them. You know, UCLA is one of them. Uh, there's a, a law review article coming out from one of our students saying uh, restorative justice and peacemaking should be required first year course and perhaps replace property as a first year course. I, I agree with it. Uh, that my my final question of the day was going to be what impact does all this should all this have on legal education? So thank you for that. Uh, okay, let me let me address the issue you raised regarding please. a confidentiality. You know how much has to be revealed in a circle process, and and on this I give credit to the Illinois State Legislature. Two years ago, the legislature passed a bill that holds that all conversations in the restorative process and it, for us that means the conversation that the participant has with our social services uh, representative to the court 
and the conversations that our participant has in pre-circle matters, arranging the circles, and then the conversations our participants have in circle, enjoy an evidentiary privilege. So nothing said in that circle can be revealed and come back and bite them in the rear end going forward. Now, sometimes it's embarrassing if their mother's in the room and the mother has uh, certainly been harmed by the conduct, but um, the mom knows that it's in the best interest of her, part, her child who is the participant to be as open and honest about everything in the circle process. Um, so kudos to our legislature and we're actually the members, the driving force of that, of that was the Chicago Catholic Legal Guild, League of Catholic Lawyers. And we're, those of us who are on the Catholic, the League of Catholic Lawyers are promoting this around the United States with other states to consider rendering conversations privileged for the purpose of this restorative process. And the first thing I do in my court is before I walk in the room, I leave my judgment outside. I'm not there to be judgmental. Nobody is there to be judgmental. Uh, and everybody is counseled on that. We're going to be restorative. We're not going to be judgmental. And that's what I tell all my fellow judges. You know, you've got to take a different view of how we do the work we do and what the result is. And if you look at the results, doing it in a restorative fashion is so much better. Judge, has, that, has it impacted your relationship with colleagues, staff, attorneys, others? No, it hasn't impacted the relationship. I get a lot of, uh, do you really do this? Do you really, mm. you know, do you, do you sit in circle and you, do you get all huggy with everybody? And I, I say, um, you know, if they're open to a hug, I'll give them a hug. I think hugs are therapeutic, uh, especially when they graduate, I'll give them a hug. Mm -hmm. um, if they, if they're not, you know, I'm not going to force it. As to the staff, the staff who work with me in the court are, have all bought into the effect, the beautiful effect that this court has had on young people who come through it. Um, so it's trying to convince the judges who are not familiar with what we do and how we do it and the, the effect it has on the community. You know, we heard in Chicago recently, we had a mayoral election and one of the mayoral candidates programs was defund the police. And I said to him, I can tell you how to do it organically. First off, open up a restorative justice court in every community in the city of Chicago. The crime rate in North Lawndale has gone down. Now, how much of that has to do with the restorative justice court? I cannot say, but I can say I'll take credit for some of it. When a crime rate in an overburdened and underserved neighborhood goes down, businesses come back in. And when businesses come back in, jobs are available. And when jobs are available, people are working for a salary instead of out there selling drugs. That means that everybody in the neighborhood can sit on their front porch on a Sunday afternoon, talking to their neighbors, watching their kids playing hopscotch on the sidewalk in front of the house, which means you don't need so many police in the neighborhood. That's how you do it. Nicely said. Judge Wesley, how about your rapport relationship with others as a result of your involvement with RJ? I, I certainly appreciate Judge Spratt's comments about uh, a, a, one of the challenges that oftentimes colleagues and uh, but what happens is that there's a paradigm shift that occurs that people that observe this occur or, uh, happen in front of their eyes, whether it's uh, uh, prosecutors, cops, um, police officers, uh, corrections officers. Um, you know, while I began the, the process, I was highly skeptical. I said, what is this? I'm not going to hold hands. I don't want to sit in a circle. I don't want to sing Kumbaya. Uh, but what I want to do is, you know, create a model that has a, a baseline of, of respect and dignity and, and acknowledgement of the, the, the challenges that, that people face. Uh, you know, I, I, in juvenile court, there was one robbery case that I had, you know, uh, had and backpack. Uh, two 12 year olds were the victims. Uh, 14 months later, they now are in court as uh, persons charged. That's because we didn't 
uh, handle, give them what was needed after they had been victimized. And so it, it, it's really endemic of, you know, uh, the, the, the title of victim. Uh, at one point, most of the folks who are in our system at, at, at some point have been victimized. Uh, and and there's been a, a failure to provide the necessary services. So I think I, I think the impact continues to uh, resonate kind of uh, through our systems. It's it's unfortunate that there are uh, the uh, um, opposition is so strong. I'm 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 not going to and and you know I I agree with uh, uh, Judge uh, Sorkin who talks about if hugging a thug actually change the uh, life trajectory of somebody. I'd be, I'd tell them, line up. I'll give you a hug if that's what you need. Uh, so it, 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 is a, it can be very, very effective. And it certainly changed my life as I dealt with my own traumas, my own uh, harms. And the fact that it actually gave me a sense of, oh, I'm not inflict, I'm not continuing to inflict harm on others who have been systemically harmed by our schools, by our child welfare system, by our financial system, by our housing system. And so it, for me, it was uh, uh, gratifying to find myself, oh, I can not only alleviate some of this, but I also can do my own set of healing. Inflicting harm to teach people that they're not supposed to harm, just intuitively seems counterproductive. Judge Wesley, you brought up hug a thug. Uh, I had written down slap on a wrist, but what do you say to folks who uh, have the perspective that this is, this is an inconsequential way to respond to a crime? Let me give you just a, a, an example of one case that we did uh, there were, um, in one case, there were 22 home visits by uh, uh, with a young person, 84 phone calls, uh, 205 text messages, and 14 peacemaking circles of approximately two hours each over a 14-month period. That's a time commitment. I've actually had people say, um, you know, I, can, can you just put me in detention? Because I don't want to mm -hmm. keep having this introspective process where I have to deal with my behaviors. Because it's real easy in our system, adversarial system, that says, I really don't have to be responsible because I'm saying not guilty all the time. Somebody else is saying I'm guilty. And then I, I really don't have to speak anymore. I don't have to engage with the person who was harmed. I don't have to acknowledge the harm. Um, it, 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 the, the, people have said that's an easier process than going through a peacemaking uh, uh, process that months long that have you, I think it has you up at night, has you in tears. It has people around you in tears because they, because they are able to see the transformation that in fact, that and it's not just the young person who is involved. And for me, young people mean, of course I'm old, so anybody under 90 is young to me, uh, but, but uh, uh, adults, I mean, you know, using brain science, people over the age of 29, that's where adulthood should come in, not this arbitrary age 18. Adults would benefit from a process that has you being introspective, uh, a process that have you taking responsibility and understanding what it's not what you did. It's really a question of what happened to you and how do you engage in someone when you say what happened to you, that 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 connection where you build trust and understanding uh, on a longer scale. Great. Uh, any other thoughts on this notion that restorative responses are somehow too lenient? Judge Strokin. Yeah, so I think one question to ask related to that is, how is the restorative justice response framed? Because I think we all are judges, we preside in different courts, um, in different legal structures and in different ways. And so you see a whole range, I think, of restorative justice from sort of one end of the continuum where there's restorative justice intervention wholly unrelated to the state or the courts or the government. And then you have 
programs where people such as Common Justice in New York, where my understanding is with the agreement of everyone, charges are dismissed and the person goes to a restorative justice program. That programs, it sounds like Judge Bratz might lead to sort of a restorative justice resolution rather than a more traditional courtroom resolution of uh, criminal events. You have uh, programs like ours where people just do the restorative, do a restorative justice program. And that's part of the mix of information and considerations presented to the judge at sentencing, but there's no specific promise or alternative. So I think that's important to ask that question about what is happening. But in terms of the significance of it, I think what Judge St. Clair pointed out is significant. It can be his program is longer and more extensive than ours, hmm. but that's a lot of time and work. And, and, that people are putting in and and it's hard time because people are confronting what they've done wrong. And I recall a children's book that I used to read to my kids and it was all about what are the hardest two words to say. And the book, as you might imagine, you know, there's this and the kids come up the, in the book with the different proposals. And of course the hardest two words to say are, I'm sorry. And, um, and so it's acknowledging what you've done and then dealing with it in an honest and authentic, responsible, meaningful way, not pretend. And and many of the um, people in our program who have been harmed talk about how hard it is, they think, for the defendants to participate and engage. So I think that, you know, I think it's a it's a serious thing. And, it, and each layer of it leads to something else. We had someone who participated recently and. Um, he went back for a second accountability circle, not our traditional original circle in our program. And uh, he had sold a significant amount of drugs. And um, he was speaking with a, a mother whose son had died of a drug overdose. And she said, explain to me what kind of person would approach a recovered addict and offer them drugs. What, why would a human being do that? What kind of monster would do that? And and he said to her, like, I, I, you know, I wasn't that person for your child, but I was that person. I did that, and he explained not not to excuse it, not to justify it, but to understand it why he did that. And that was helpful to that mother. Didn't like it, but it was helpful. And it was also led the two of them to an agreement that part of what he should do is reach out to the people he'd sold drugs to, to both apologize to them mm -hmm. and also offer them assistance in connection with reaching out with a drug treatment professional to offer them an opportunity to go to drug treatment. That's really starting to make amends. Mm -hmm. And a way that, you know, the traditional response to someone who sells drugs is we'll put you in prison. But those customers, the research shows of that drug dealer, if it's a retail drug dealer, are highly likely in the near future to overdose, many of them. There's a much higher overdose rate after the arrest of a drug dealer, is my understanding. And so those people, like the reaching out, if you ask the question, repairing the harm, you'd reach out, somebody would reach out to try to send them to treatment. And so that's really repairing the harm. And that's circles back. So I think it's a very, I mean, I don't agree with the people who say, oh, it's nothing. It's nothing if it's not real. But if it's real, it's real. And it really addresses the real issues and the problems and the harm. The, the I'm sorry's that we hear typically feel very performative and often use the passive voice. I'm sorry for what happened to you. Yeah. And there's very little Ownership well, I think that's of that. a great point. And that's often the sorry in the courtroom. Right. And one of the things that Daniel Sarad says in her book, which I think is a very powerful expression, is doing sorry. Right. So it's one thing to say I'm sorry, but doing sorry. So that person I was talking about who is committed to go on and make this effort with the people to whom he sold drugs, that's doing sorry. Right. And that's different. And that makes it more. Um, incorporates it into your life and it makes it more real and makes it, its actual repair. Uh, for anyone who hasn't read Daniel Sered, S-E-R-E-D, her book, um, I can't believe it's just 
vanished from my brain. Until we reckon. Until, Until we, we reckon. reckon. Thank you. Uh, it's well worth a read. Judge Connors, I'm going to loop back to something you said earlier. Uh, and seeing that you are on the bench and you're wearing your robe and maybe you have a gavel there and you've got a couple of flags. Do you see those uh, attributes as being essential to presiding? Or can a judge retain their authority, if you will, without all those trappings? Well, um, I think there is a powerful moment when we have all of this power con concentrated here, and then it moves out and is diffused into the circle in the courtroom. Um, you'll also notice up here are things that are gifts from our tribal courts, and my things are in those things as well. Um, and my gifts, my Irish gifts are in their, their courtrooms. So you can probably see that there's a peace pipe right up here that's next to my name that was given for the American Indian Law Section. And there's a gavel that was given to me by a peacemaker. And so I have a state court gavel. And I have one that's been given to me by uh, a tribal court. And so when the people come in, I say, I've got the state court one I can hit you over the head with. Or I've got the one which is a sturgeon over the egg for the generations that follow, which one that you want to use. So I think that, you know, again, uh, the reason I, I say this is that if we're going to transform our judicial system, it's important to actively say, we have this in place. If it doesn't work, we have a, a system that can label. But we consciously are moving away from that and going out. I just want to go back to one thing, Mr. Sands, what the judges are saying when you said, is it easy, too easy? The attorneys who have gone and skeptically gone into circle are the first to say it is much harder. It is a much harder, even for the attorneys. So, um, you know, I'm I'm just so thrilled to hear from these other judges around the country that they're seeing it too. This is wonderful. Judge Spratt, tell us, and you you mentioned this earlier, but for judicial and other skeptics out there who are committed to public safety, what does your data show about the efficacy of restorative approaches? Well, first off, the recidivist rate. The 13% recidivist rate of people who successfully come through the restorative justice program versus people who go through the court system with similar charges and aren't referred to restorative justice. I, it says it all, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but even more than that, and this is reaching a bit, but nonetheless, Take a look at New Zealand. New Zealand, every juvenile offense charge is held in a restorative practice. They don't use traditional court. They don't use retributive court. And it works. If the um, proof is in the pudding, there it is. There it is. And in terms of changing people in their in the circle process. Yes, it's difficult. It takes a long time. I tell them when they come to my court, you're in charge of how long this takes. We would like to see it completed in a year, but we're not we are not bound to that year. If it takes you more than three or four circles to come to an agreement with your circle keepers and come up with a repair of harm agreement, take the time. We want you to be very careful about what you're agreeing to do because you're not going to be forced to do anything that you will agree. And then when once you have the repair of harm agreement, be deliberative and deliberate about performing those goals or reaching those goals and those tasks. You know, don't just give uh, lip service to it. Think through what you said you would do and do it and take your time. We had one young person who took three years, but when he graduated, the room erupted because it was just a monumentous thing for him. And, and he was one of my my best huggers. <laughs> when they do something that is successful for them, 
You know, I tell them all the time, potential does not discriminate. Opportunity does. And you have potential. Tap into it. Find out what it is you're good at doing and turn that into a life's avocation. And that has worked with so many of our young people. So, geez, Bobby, I, I forgot the thread of your question. <laughs> oh, it was something about uh, proof in the pudding. There it in is. Term, in terms of uh, recidivism rates. And so many of our, I ask them when they graduate or when they're dismissed. From time to time, we're com we're uh, contacted by members of the press or members in academia wanting to have a conversation with one of our successful participants. Do I have your authority to give them your contact information? 95% of them say yes. A whole group of them come back to the court once they're graduated and they're out there earning money legitimately and they act as mentors. And that happened, that just, as, as I, I love to see things happen organically, that happened organically. They just came back to help the people because it's community driven. So it's people who are their neighbors who are going through this now and coming out the, the backside as uh, successful participants. It, I love the idea that court can be a place where people are caught doing good. Yeah. Because that is not historically how the system has worked. Uh, Judge Sinclair, I need to loop back to something that you said earlier, and you talked about disproportionate impacts on black and brown people. And I'm curious, and I'll open it up to others as well, do you see broader use of RJ as uh, a way to address some systemic imbalances and injustices that permeate the justice system? Well, you know, I don't call it a justice system intentionally because uh, in my 30 years, I didn't see a lot of justice systemically occurring. Um, and so, you know, it, you know, peacemaking uh, is a uh, indigenous practice that I learned it from uh, the Clinkett Takish clan uh, up in the Yukon uh, uh, with Mark Wedge and uh, Barry Stewart, a Canadian judge and, and, and Kay Prentice. Uh, th those are my teachers, my lineage. And it being an indigenous practice, every, everybody owns it. And, you know, it's like the sun, you know, no one, no one says this belongs only to me. Everyone can utilize it. I, I just like giving credit for, I think, uh, for, uh, for folk to, to my lineage. Uh, but I, it, it's interesting. Every, when we have engaged in circle and we have, you know, youth of color sitting in it and, and parents, we oftentimes have parents engaged in the circle, support circles as well. Uh, we have a large, uh, uh, the Mali community uh, in Seattle, we have a, uh, uh, as well as Latinx community, uh, people say, oh yeah, I, I know this. This is what I used to, uh, this is what I used to do with what my parents did, my grandparents did. You know, they spoke of, this was our, how we handled disputes. So it's, it's very uh, relatable to a um, lot, to, I think to everyone, you know, uh, uh, and 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 when you are operating in places where you are not the only person who looks like you, uh, truth is, oftentimes when you're into the criminal and uh, civil system, uh, those folks in control and power don't look like you, and you are subject to relegated to whatever they dictate as is going to be occurring. But when you are, you know, peacemaking has the, a major component is community. And when you have community at the table engaging, uh, then it really changes the, the very, I think, foundation of uh, how it is uh, viewed by the community as a whole. Oh, it has some credibility that oftentimes our judicial system actually is losing credibility at this point because of behaviors that we see at both the local and national level. Whereas peacemaking actually, I think, has the ability to sustain and maintain that, oh, you're listening because it's, it's a listening process. Um, and and 
the um, no offense to any of the judges, but we don't listen very good. We we're 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 in our own own heads and places. We got the responses already lined up. It is you know though this is a two hundred three you know theft response or you know a bail response well one hundred eight uh, uh, in peacemaking and in, in in restorative practices at least my again my opinion is it really teaches us how to engage and be present in a different way that is more humanistic, more holistic, and uh, uh, speaks to the, uh, uh, you know, I always have struggled with the word restore uh, because I don't want to make, I don't want to put back this broken system, excuse me, it's not a broken system, excuse me, because it's operating just like people want it to operate, maintaining marginalization, gener generational marginalization for uh, poor black and brown uh, LBGTQ disabled folk. So I don't want to put that back together. But when you think of the uh, indigenous concept of restoring, you're restoring a humanistic uh, element. We're reverting back to, oh, we are in relation, long-term relation. So I, I uh, to get back to the question, I really think it does have, it has a certain appeal to uh, lots of folks of color, lots of communities, and lots of cultural communities. Um, and of course, that's why, you know, New Zealand decided to adopt it as national law, mm. is because they saw the outcome that was occurring for the Maori in their uh, the criminal legal processing systems. And it was out of control. And now, and, and they use it actually as well into the adult system too, uh, for very serious crimes, murder, rape, you know, robberies with injuries, assault with injuries, because it's just the standard of how do we repair these harms? What's Because our traditional non-victim uh, centered model, which is what our system is, I think in the United States, we, you know, victim is a a term of art, we, you know, in order to achieve an outcome from the prosecutorial position. So that's, that's, that's my thought. Uh, thank you. Let me just remind folks, if you have questions or comments, please use the Q&A function. Uh, Judge St. Clair, I love uh, Kay Pranis' response, and I've been fortunate to sit and train with her on a number of occasions where somebody says, well, this is uh, cultural appropriation. And, and yes, there has to be sensitivity to that. But what she said is that every one of us at some point in our ancestry had people who sat in circle to resolve dispute. And we've, we've really outsourced our responses to harm. Uh, and 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 to some extent sanitized that harm, but it's messy, it's complicated, and it takes time to address. Uh, so somewhat related to that, Judge Connors, let me start with you, but others please weigh in. Uh, I have heard some judges say, but what about due process? How can you have restorative justice in a system that uh, depends upon due process. So I'll, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I'm not sure what the criticism is. So tell me what the criticism you've heard of that's how restorative, first of all, what do you mean by due process? I mean, <laughs> it's my understanding due process is everybody has the right to be heard and has notice and Decisions aren't made without participation. So from my standpoint, it, it enhances the concept of due process because everybody is part of it. And so I, I, I'm, I'm not even quite sure how to respond to a criticism like that. And I, maybe, you've, maybe, you've heard it in, maybe you've heard it in ways that I, I, I just don't even, I don't understand it. I don't understand what the, what the concern would be. How about rights against self-incrimination? Or right to counsel. Oh, you know, Judge Brett, she went. She, she really made the the excellent point that um, 
we do it by contract that it is confidential it cannot be used against you it cannot be whatever is done in circle can't it can't be disclosed and then judges have to back that up so if the attempt is made say no you cannot that is not going to be part of it etc you have to create that space in that place where people feel that they can be honest truthful listen care everything judge st Clair talked about bringing humanity back into the justice system it is there so when you, we all we always talk about rights but right with rights comes responsibility and responsibility we have within ourselves and to each other community to the individual the individual to the to the community so you know uh, and i really like what judge st Clair is saying he's absolutely right about this we have a system that is not designed for rights for everybody. I mean, it just isn't. Peacemaking takes it back to the idea that this is an, what we said in our Declaration of Independence, certain unal unalienable rights endowed to us by our creator. We're born with it. Anyone else want to weigh in on the due process question? Judge I think you, no. um, you have to find a way to um, whatever restorative justice process you have, you have to marry it to the existing legal system if it's run by the courts in some way. So you can do what Judge Connors and Judge Spratt happens, says happens in their jurisdictions where what happens there is confidential. It can't be used against you. Well, then that solves the Fifth Amendment issue. I think there's a question of voluntariness, I mean, which is at the heart of the restorative justice anyway. I don't think it's really, you know, forcing people to say they're sorry, for example, isn't really meaningful. And so there has to be some element of voluntariness uh, in what they do and, and their choice to participate in this and their and more and their choice to continue with it and do sorry or go on with it and beyond just showing up at the first circle and you can um, resolve the legal issues in various ways if you pay attention to how you do it as everybody has in the various ways that they do it so i think that it's you know is it something to think about when you're creating a restorative justice program or process of course but if someone's reflexive response is you can't do that uh, I think the answer is, why not? Explain mm -hmm. to me why we can't and enable people to have a right to, people's right to counsel is a right to counsel at trial and in the courtroom at critical stages of the proceedings. And so um, nothing prevents people from waiving various rights. They can choose to participate in restorative justice circle without their lawyer. And they could choose to do so only if there are certain protections. For example, say the ones that Judge Connors in his jurisdiction described. So. And they should talk about that with their lawyer. Nothing wrong with that. Makes perfect sense. They should do that. So um, uh, that strikes me as issues to address, think about, and resolve. The fundamental principle of due process is an opportunity to be heard. Now, most of the criminal cases that go to trial in Cook County, the defendant doesn't take the stand. It's dangerous. The defendant would be subjected to cross-examination and could crumble under that with a good cross examiner so they have a right to be heard but they voluntarily do not exercise that right they don't go on the stand whereas in the circle process they have every opportunity to be heard and they can frame what they want to say the way they want without being prompted by a clever cross examiner eventually because they form relationships with the people in the circle they let go and they let everything come out and that's the basis then, that forms the basis of the repair of harm agreement. What are we going to do to repair this harm that was done to you, that was done to the community, that was done to the, the victim, if there is one, that was done to your mother? You know, How are we going to repair this? What are you going to do? And those repair of harm agreements are as absolutely as creative as everybody in the room. There's an infinite variety of things they can do to repair the harm. The one I love is to write a letter of reflection to somebody, to their future self, to their child, to their mother. That's guaranteed once they write that and they come into court with it, that's guaranteed that I'm going to cry and my mascara is going to run. 
So uh, they get due process in restorative <laughs> justice. So we have about, thank you, Judge Pratt. We have about 10 more minutes, I think, before we'll go to Q&A. So I have two, uh, I don't know, maybe tough questions. And I'd love it uh, if each of you would weigh in, but obviously, as in other restorative processes, uh, it's an invitation and feel free to pass. But one of the amazing things about uh, Avery Arrington is she always assembles panels from across the country and today is no exception. What message do you have for other sitting judges or perhaps lawyers who aspire to be judges? Anyone can go first. Explore the restorative process. And I'm with Judge St. Clair. I'm not sure I like the word restorative for a lot of reasons. Let's just re let's call it the human humanity process. Let's explore that as an option. We've been wedded to the 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 British system because we brought it with us over from Britain. And putting somebody away in jail and removing them from society is not the answer. I would say to people who are judges or unfamiliar what we all with what we all call restorative justice um, or lawyers, whether they aspire to be judges or don't aspire to be judges, I would suggest to them to learn and um, especially to learn before they express opinions. And so before they decide that they know what restorative justice is when they've done no research and no experiential learning and no a discussion with anyone else and before they've decided that it's legally impossible because of the due process clause and that it's wrong and soft and all these other things they say, it would be best to first to learn to know what they're talking about. I always think that that's helpful if you're a lawyer uh, or a judge. And so I tell them to learn, to go to a circle, go to watch this panel, uh, read some of the material, read some books on it, read some materials, engage, form their own opinions, gather some information. And to learn. And then I suspect that if they do that, they will find what we have all found, which is that it can be a very powerful way of thinking about and approaching disputes and problems. And one that I call the system in which I work, or part of the system in which I work, the criminal justice system. And I know others, I respect them for it, call it the criminal legal system. And I understand why they do. I call it the criminal justice system because I think that that what we should be doing is aspiring for justice on earth. And we, the, or the world is not a completely just place, um, but uh, we can aspire to that and we can improve the system. We can improve ourselves. We can um, improve the world around us and we can improve the people with whom we have touch. And so I, I think this is an important way to do that. And um, so I encourage people. That's what I would encourage other judges, lawyers, aspiring judges to do, to learn about this and engage with it, because they, I think they will find it a powerful uh, way to think about and approach disputes and problems. Great. Two, in addition to the Daniel Sered book that you mentioned, Changing Lenses by Howard Zare, Z-E-H-R, or The Little Book of Restorative Justice by mm -hmm. Howard Zare, certainly good starting places. And then we have circle process. A little, little blurry, uh, Judge St. Clair, but sorry, <laughs> th there's a lot of material. So uh, Judge St. Clair, any yeah, messages yeah. to your... Yeah, I, I, I really I really agree. You know, curiosity. Uh, uh, put your judgment aside and say, let me have curiosity as I, I, as I engage in this inquiry. And um, uh, uh, get in contact with some of your community-based organizations that are doing the work. You know, uh, sometimes our experts are, you know, uh, experts in, in in title only, but not in in fact. And um, uh, I, I just, you know, and and really, I think the uh, the the data that Judge Spratt has uh, generated is uh, very helpful. I've I've reviewed it once. I need to read it again because I'm a slow reader. But it is a uh, uh, something that has a, creates a recidivism rate of 13 percent versus the standard. And if you talk to DLC, it's only 35 percent. But everyone else says it's 60 percent. Um, then that has that should raise your uh, 
uh, curiosity to say, what is going on with this? Uh, as opposed to our system that uh, uh, tends to uh, recycle people very, very heavily. It, it also should hit people in the wallet in a, in a positive way, those yeah. uh, improved numbers, lower recidivism rates. Judge Connors, message for your colleagues across the country. If I might, I'd like to read in a letter that I received from a victim in a uh, adult uh, shooting case where there was a conviction, um, a, a stiff sentence that involved an altercation between an older man and a younger man, a parking spot that escalated, gun was drawn for self-defense and went off accidentally. Both the victim and the young man asked for restorative justice, which was denied by the prosecutor and by the judge. And he was sentenced to 12 years in prison, very high sentence. Two years into his prison sentence, the Court of Appeals reversed the conviction for error in the proceedings and, asked, and indicated it should be uh, sent to a different judge. The, this time around, a new prosecutor uh, asked and listened to the victim. They sent it to me because of, I did have the restorative justice program. And they met before the new trial and went in circle and reached an agreement. And um, let me just read to you what the victim said about this process, because I want to say this to my, our fellow judges. Here's what came back to me before the resentencing. Dear Judge Connors and prosecutor, I won't mention the name. I wrote a letter for the last sentencing to say that I was not interested in a punitive sentence being given to the defendant. I did not think him being put in prison would address my issues or help us understand what happened that night or make anyone better going forward. Unfortunately, at that time, no one listened to me and the defendant was sent to prison. It was actually a relief for me when his conviction was changed and he came back for a new sentence. I appreciated that the new prosecutor talked to me and listened to me and took my wishes into consideration about no more punishment. I am also grateful that the defendant and I were able to meet in the restorative justice program to talk about what happened why it happened, our thoughts about it. I was able to tell him how I was harmed and I got to understand what was going on with him and how he has also been hurt by all of this. The meeting helped the both of us and I believe he truly takes responsibility for his actions and is sorry and that he should be able to go forward and live his life without any more burdens. I understand that he wants to make a life for himself and finish school and that there is a way for him not to have this on his record so he doesn't have any more burdens or punishment. I support this. He has been punished enough and he understands and I don't want any more. I am asking as the victim that the judge and prosecutor let him move forward. I did not ask for restitution before, and I am not asking for any order of restitution now. Thank you for listening to me. I am not able to attend the resentencing, but I wish the defendant best moving forward and thank the prosecutor and court for listening. My message to our colleagues is why in the world would you be threatened by this? <laughs> Incredibly powerful. I suggest to my my colleagues that watch just watch it in action. I I use a hybrid model for our restorative justice court because we have young people who can't make it to what serves as the courtroom uh, because they're on electronic monitoring or because they have to keep their job. They can step away from their job for fifteen minutes to appear on Zoom, but they can't come and sit all day and wait to be heard in court. So I use a hybrid model. 
And with that model, I can invite people to come in and observe. I just ask that they keep their cameras off, keep their microphones off. And just if it's a judge, just put observer as your name. And some do. Some come and observe and have it's changed their point of view on it. That's the best way. Show and tell. We have conflated punishment and accountability. And I think across society and often on the bench, the notion is accountability means punishment. But I think each of you has uh, helped us appreciate that their accountability is much more complicated than that. I can't tell you how many more questions I have. Uh, how should legal education change? How do we expose future lawyers and judges to RJ? How do we avoid net widening and bringing people into the system for a restorative response who maybe shouldn't even be brought into the system at all? But because of the time, I'm going to hold those questions. And Avery, I'm hoping maybe you've oh, done yeah. some, some uh, screening of, of questions and uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you all um, panelists, judges. I really appreciate your insight into today's topic. Um, there are a couple of comments, uh, and I'm going to try to theme them all together. There was one comment, one of our first ones that uh, asked or was asking the question or comment about looking at convergent facilitation, which is a practice uh, and can be used in legislative action for child custody proceedings. So it's a collaborative decision-making process. Um, and just taking, just, I will send that link to you, but they were recommending you take a look at that because some of the same principles uh, can be found in the nonviolent communication work of Marshall Rosenberg. Uh, there were a couple of questions, um, which I think it's a consensus among the group that uh, working with older people or adults, I think Judge St. Clair, you mentioned adults should probably be considered mm -hmm. 29 and up. So I would say the answer is yes, you would consider uh, restorative justice work being applied to older um, individuals instead of just in the juvenile kind of lane with younger folks, right? Okay, great. Um, oh, I'm heating up here. So here's another mm -hmm. question. How do you reconcile doing restorative justice in the court system, which is based on historically hierarchy and power? So how do we reconcile doing this work given the structure is set up um, that has you know hierarchy and power that's throughout this system? And we know that RJ is asking for something completely different. In our court, it, the power is in the hand of the participant. You know, they know what is expected to, for them to come through the process successfully. And if they engage and participate wholeheartedly and come through the process, the power has been in their hands. It, and I think it also, what Judge Spread is saying, I think it requires a conscious effort by those of us who have that power to surrender it as our responsibility. It's really talking about giving power back to the people in the yeah. sense of we're letting the community be involved in it. And so uh, it, 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 it creates this power sharing uh, process and you have to uh, you, you have to acquiesce. I mean, it's you're still within you know, the uh, guidelines of your your local constitution, regulation, uh, rules of judicial conduct. But the reality is, there's ways to make that happen, and that allows for the input of the community to be gathered and heard, and for you as the judicial officer to. Uh, consider those in when you're at that point of um, uh, sentencing or at... Thank you. Okay, I have another question. This is more technical and this might be individual based on um, where you all preside. So 
what percentage of cases that come to the court can we sustainably send the RJ route? So how many cases essentially can Circle Keeper see per month or per year? And like I said, that's really technical depending on where you are geographically. So I'll let you all kind of answer that. Well, the more cases we get, the more circle keepers and case managers we need to hire. It's So we have to go back to our county board and say we need more money and make the case to the to the fund, fund providers why we need that more money in order to sustain the case law that's come, the case load that's coming in. That's why I'm not teaching this class. I teach another one of the uh, similar but different, I would say for us, our program is not huge in terms of the percentage of the criminal cases that we have in Boston. Uh, the primary limitation we face is resources, the resources of the circle keepers, the, the facilitators, we call them, both to run the circles, but also the different parts of the program. More resources, we would, we would have more cases, we'd have more uh, harmed persons who wish to participate, we'd have more defendants who wish to participate, we have more people who want to participate than we have um, space available. Thank you. Makes me think, uh, Avery, I just wanted to weigh in one, that uh, RJ for legislators, policymakers, and funders would be worthwhile. Uh, and one of the questions I didn't ask was, as we enter what is likely to be a challenging and fraught election cycle, what message do you all have for policymakers? But it seems to me, based on what Judge Spratt and others have said, this is a, this is a wise investment as compared to the system that we've had for so long. Avery, sorry, back to you. No, you're fine. Judge St. Clair, did you have something to add? You know, RJ is a, a tool. It, it's not the answer, not the only answer. We, it's, but it is, it is, a response that actually come can generate these different outcomes. Uh, and so if we're, we're really looking at outcomes, we want to do things so that people are not recycling back into our system, but are actually leaving our system as tax paying, contributing members of their community, dads, moms, uncles, aunts, and uh, doing uh, 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 and, 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 and it becomes a, a cost avoidance and a cost saving. So that's the that's how you take it to the legislative branch and have them talk about that. And and uh, I think there are programs that are out there, not a lot. There are programs that are out there. Certainly you see more programs in schools as they're starting to uh, emerge and develop that uh, uh, really demonstrate, oh, we our outcomes are changing. We have increased graduation rates. We have re reduced out-of-school suspensions. We have uh, reduced uh, incidents within the classroom as a whole. So we don't need the law enforcement officer stationed in the building because we know that leads to actually more involvement. Uh, and the other point is, this is absolutely uh, applicable for adults you know, almost regardless of their age, because uh, we've all been traumatized and injured and had have harms. And this is a uh, a way to address some of those uh, deep seated harms that, you know, we carry that I, I used to carry in my backpack, you know, my invisible backpack, but, you know, the boulders. And, um, and, and so it's, it, it really is a, uh, uh, a, a applicable to just about everyone who has understood. I'm not saying it, uh, people shouldn't be punished. I'm just saying our accountability can't only look like incarceration because incarceration now is the currency of punishment. I'll give you more jail and that you're going to learn something because you're in jail. Well, but if that were true, we would have a zero uh, 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 reoffense rate and we would have no crime anywhere. So not true. Okay, there are, we could be here all day. <laughs> I will draft these questions up and get them over to you all, but I wanna be uh, mindful and respectful of everyone's time. 
So thank you all for tuning in. We really appreciate you. We appreciate the panelists joining us for today. Um, are there any final thoughts from anyone? And I wanted to go ahead and plug in one more. And I know that Judge Connors, you got something. We just need you to unmute over there. I had some hot mic issues. So if someone can <laughs> unmute for you, that would be fabulous. All right, no, we can't hear you. Okay, well, we're figuring that out quickly. September 15th, the National Center is offering uh, restorative justice and legal education that has came up a couple of times. It's a virtual symposium for law students, uh, folks looking to gather and learn more about restorative justice content and practices in a law school context. So that event, um, I'll be sending that out with some of the posts uh, survey feedback information, but you can register for that online. And that's happening Friday, September 15th from 12 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's interesting that we kept bringing that back of what folks are learning and how we can continue to embed restorative justice in, in folks' education. Thank you all again. I really appreciate it. We're one minute over. Um, take care, folks, and I'll see you either September 15th or the next webinar. We'll get those out there. So take care, folks. Thank you, Avery. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you.